good uh, good morning one and all uh, my name is uh, dr saranya i am a senior resident of uh, department of ent from sri lakshmi narayana institute of medical sciences today we are going to uh, see about the topic of otosclerosis uh, first what is meant by otosclerosis otosclerosis is defined as the hereditary disorder of the bony lamellae in which the normal lamellar bone is replaced by the irregular uh, spongy bone normally the bony lamellae has three layers endosteal enchondral and periosteal layer in which the enchondral layer has some cartilage dust which usually ossifies later in the life but here in this otosclerosis this cartilage dust they uh, form a spongy bone which is a irregular bone which uh, has a tendency to become a hard bone later causing sclerosis of the um, stapes and cochlea leading to otosclerosis otosclerosis is synonymous with otospongiosis a uh, foci of otosclerosis contains a uh, decrease uh, resorption of the bone with increased new bone formation and along with that some connective tissue and vascular pro proliferations are present these things causes the immobilization of the stapes which leads to conductive deafness so uh, hereditary disorder it is mainly an autosomal dominant disorder which is characterized by the formation of a spongy bone which causes uh, immobilization or fixation of the foot plate which reduces the transmission of the sound from the external ear into the inner ear so the formed bone is very spongy and it has two stages as active and inactive uh, in active stage there is more uh, vascularity and connective tissue so hence here there is uh, no role for uh, surgical management so medical management is preferred later this active stage becomes into mature stage where there is more cellularity with more osteocytes and osteoblasts which leads to inactive stage which in which condition we can do a surgery for the uh, purpose so this is the picture showing the uh, otosclerotic foci present in the foot plate of the stapes this picture shows uh, the otosclerotic uh, lesion surrounding the entire suprastructure and along with it uh, some uh, incredible joint is also involved which leads to conductive hearing loss so uh, regarding the history antonio valsalva first described the ankylosis of stapes in 1741 and adam politzer coined the term otosclerosis in 1893 Frederick Sebenmam coined the term otosponjosis in 1912. So next is epidemiology. The exact etiology of the disease is not known. Usually it is uh, an autosomal dominant disease which usually runs in family history. So any patient with uh, otosclerosis might have a family history of conductive hearing loss also. And now it's uh, sporadic also. Uh, sporadic incidence is also reported. it is more common in white race and indians and there is sex predilection of women than men and with a ratio of 2 is to 1 and it is usually common in second and third decade of the life and it is a usually a slow onset but progressive disease the hearing loss usually is a slow onset and uh, it occurs uh, very slowly and it is a progressive If the patient is having uh, 20 decibel loss then it will gradually worsen with age and it can um, become a severe conductive hearing loss later in life and it is also uh, reported that the there is some uh, incidence of uh, hearing loss aggravated by stress factors like trauma post surgery and uh, in women especially for uh, during pregnancy and uh, hormonal causes also related like menopause and uh, viral etiology is also suspected and then uh, otosclerosis is uh, associated with certain skeletal disorders like uh, pages disease and osteogenesis imperfecta Uh, there is a uh, condition called as van der hove syndrome which is a uh, triad of osteogenesis imperfecta otosclerosis and blue sclera and next we are going to see about the types of otosclerosis what are the different types of otosclerosis first is the stepidial type which is the most common type of otosclerosis in stepidial type the otosclerotic lesion involves the foot plate of stapes stepidio vestibular joint and oval window this causes a fixation of the stapes so sound won't transmit from the external middle ear into the inner ear hence the patient will be having conductive hearing loss conductive hearing loss means what the ear conduction is affected and uh, next type is cochlear type which is very less common than the stepidial type here the otosclerotic lesions are present in um, 
cochlea promontory and over the round window so this doesn't cause uh, conductive hearing loss but there is a probability of getting sensory neural hearing loss the sensory neural hearing loss occurs due to the release of the toxins into the endolymph or uh, perilymph and causing the damage to the cochlea so uh, next type is uh, mixer type which uh, involves the lesion of both tps as well as the round window and the fourth one is called malignant here there is a rapidly progressing cochlear lesion with severe sensory neural hearing loss the patient will be having severe sensory neural hearing loss the main type and the other main type is called histological otosclerosis here the patient um, doesn't have any symptoms patient is usually asymptomatic uh, but uh, the disease is found histopathologically later after post mortem examination and then uh, stepidial otosclerosis there are my, five main types of stepidial type of otosclerosis these are anterior posterior circumferential biscuit type and obliterate so anterior type means what otosclerotic involving the anterior part of the foot plate or present to mm anterior to the oval window this is site is the common site for otosclerosis this is also called as fistula antifenestrum and uh, posterior focus means the uh, lesion is present to mm behind the oval window near the posterior part of the foot plate and circumferential doesn't involve the foot plate it involves the margin of the foot plate and biscuit type is the type in which it the uh, otosclerotic lesion is present in the foot plate of the stapes but the margins are free obliterative type uh, means the entire the otosclerotic lesion is present towards the entire foot plate the margin as well as the crura this uh, obliterative type is the most severe type here the stapedectomy or stapy surgery which we uh, do as a treatment for otosclerosis is very difficult to operate on this type of patient and uh, next is the clinical features how the present patient presents so usually a uh, patient of otosclerosis will be coming to opd the patient will be usually uh, young patient in second or third decade around 25 to 30 or 35 and uh, patient will be it is more common in females than male but males also can present and the patient will be having a soft and monotonous voice with hard of hearing which is a slow onset and progressive hearing loss and uh, patient will be having no other uh, specific symptoms only hard of hearing will be the main symptom so the deafness uh, is usually a conductive type of deafness which is usually bilateral unilateral can also occur and it is a insidious onset slowly progressive disease so in stepidial type of otosclerosis the hearing loss will be conductive type and in cochlear hearing loss uh, cochlear otosclerosis it is usually sensory neural hearing loss if it is a both uh, mixer type of uh, both stepidial and otosclerosis is uh, together then the patient will be having mixer type of hearing loss and the patient will be having soft monotonous and modulated voice unlike the patients of sensory neural hearing loss who will be having a loud voice or they will be shouting and uh, vertigo and tinnitus are the symptoms which are usually not seen commonly but if it is present we should have to suspect that there is cochlear involvement cochlear type of otosclerosis is seen and paracusis willisi is a condition in which the patient usually hears better in a noisy environment than in the quiet environment actually the our normal normally we'll hear better in a quiet environment than a noisy environment but in otosclerosis since a patient is having a conductive hearing loss the opposite patient will have to raise the voice usually in the noisy environment will raise the voice right so the patient uh, will hear because the opposite person is raising his voice to hear so speech discrimination also becomes better in uh, noisy environment so this is uh, the person thomas willis uh, willis who uh, introduced that uh, paracusis willis and uh, examination next is examination usually otosclerosis the external otoclinal tympanic membrane middle ear is normal there is no other associated any symptom uh, any signs no seen but in some cases of active type of otosclerosis where there is more hypervascularity the lesion is more hypervascular especially uh, when the lesion is over the cochlear type cochlear means in present in the uh, round window or promontory the lesions will be vascular so it will be reflected into the tympanic membrane and we can see a blush uh, some pinkish color over the tympanic membrane this is called as short signs of flamingo pink appearance so if the patient is having this sign uh, the patient is not taken up for surgery because it is a active type the disease process is active so uh, surgery has no role
next uh, when we are doing the tuning fork test uh, what uh, what are the inference will be getting in case of stepidial type of photosclerosis training stress will be negative that is r conduction is affected so bone conduction is more than r conduction and it is in weber it is usually lateralized to the here with conductive hearing loss or if the patient is having bilateral conductive hearing loss it will be lateralized to the ear which has more conductive hearing loss and the abc test is used to test for uh, bone conduction that is sensorineural hearing loss since the patient is having only conductive hearing loss abc is not reduced it is normal okay it is normal in both the ears so this is the uh, uh, inference we will be getting in stepidial type of otosclerosis that is conductive hearing loss in cochlear type of uh, otosclerosis we will be having sensorineural hearing loss so renis test will be normal or sorry uh, will be positive so our conduction will be better than bone conduction if we are doing weber's test if it is case of unilateral hearing sensory neural hearing loss it will be lateralized to the opposite better ear but if the patient is having both ear sensory neural hearing loss it will be lateralized to the ear with much less sensory loss and uh, abc test is a confirmatory test for sensory neural hearing loss that is bone conduction is reduced that of the examiner so it is reduced in both both uh, both sides both ears and uh, if it is a mixer type of otosclerosis with uh, stepidial and cochlear then renis test will be negative that is there is a conductive component hence bone conduction is more than r conduction and it lat uh, lateralizes to the better ear because uh, snhl is also present usually it will be lateralized to the better ear and abc test confirms because the patient is having sensory neural hearing loss it will be reduced in both ears these are the inferences when we are doing a tuning fork test And next is the Jellies test. Previously, Jellies test was the confirmatory tuning fork test, which is used to identify the otosclerosis. Here, we'll uh, keep the vibrating tuning fork over the mastoid, and we'll raise the external auditory canal pressure by sigillation. That is, we'll use a Siegel speculum to uh, raise the pressure of the external auditory canal. This pressure will be transmitted to the middle ear through the ossicles, and it causes the stiffness of the inner ear also. The basilar membrane organ of corti will be Uh, stiffen hence when we are testing the bone conduction for a normal person the bone conduction will be reduced so usually when we are doing jellies test the since uh, uh, the bone conduction will be reduced but in case of otosclerosis the patient will be having fixation of stapes so whatever pressure we are giving through the external and middle ear it won't be transmitted to the inner ear hence there is no change in bone conduction it will be same as that of the examiner next we will be doing the audiological test since a patient is having conductive hearing loss we have to proceed what is the type what is the degree how much is lost uh, which ear is more affected so we have will be doing uh, something called pure tone audiometry so in place of pure tone audiometry we will be getting a graph like this this is the curve of bone conduction this is the curve of r conduction here r conduction is affected bone conduction is usually normal it is within 10 decibel so r conduction is affected so the curve is much lower and the, the lower frequencies like 250 500 1000 hertz are more affected than the higher frequencies and there is a r bone gap r bone gap is the indicative of conductive deafness so the r bone gap is above 15 decibel between this and this we can see above 20 decibel of r bone gap so this is the curve we will be getting in conductive hearing loss patient and then uh, there is a specific uh, uh, specific uh, mark uh, um, notch called as carhart's notch which is usually seen in otosclerosis that is there is a dip in bone conduction curve at 2000 hertz this is called as carhart's notch this notch is specific only for otosclerosis this notch disappears after successful stapes surgery why this notch occurs because each and every part of the middle ear has its own resonance that is it vibrates specific for that frequency but ossicles have more specific resonance for 2000 hertz since it vibrates maximum at that frequency since there is stapes fixation it doesn't vibrate so there is a maximum dip at 2000 hertz which is called as carhart's notch which is specific for otosclerosis so revolve theory of stapes fixation disturbs the normal ossicular resonance at 2000 hertz and uh, normal compression mode of bone conduction is also disturbed because of the relative perilymph will also become immobile because tape is won't move so perilymph will be immobile so this uh, bone conduction is also uh, affected which is maximally projected at 2000 hertz and sometimes it is also uh, told as a mechanical artifact 
during uh, testing of the year. So usually cohort notch reverses after a successful step is surgery. Next, we will be doing uh, speech audiometry. The speech audiometry is done uh, in order to find the uh, speech discrimination score, uh, the property of the patient understanding and reproducing the word successfully. So I mean, uh, uh, normally the patients, normally the patients, normal patients will have uh, speech discrimination score above the ninety uh, percent. And in case of conductive hearing loss, also it is above ninety percent. And in uh, usually in case of cochlear and retrocochlear hearing loss, speech discrimination score is very poor, but below fifty percent, like that. So in uh, stapedial type of otosclerosis, places, the speech discrimination is uh, almost achieved up to ninety to hundred percent. We are doing a speech discrimination score. If the patient is having less than sixty percent, it means the patient is also having some sensory neural hearing loss also. So these patients are not apt for surgery. They are candidates for hearing aids. So this is the speech audiometric curve. Here we can see normal patient. Normally the persons will have speech discrimination at hundred percent. Conductive hearing also we can achieve a speech discrimination score of ninety percentage, but Normal persons, we can achieve speech discrimination score at 30 decibel itself, but conductive patients have hearing loss. Hence, the 100 percentage of speech discrimination score is only achieved when we increase the intensity. That is up to 60 to 70 decibel of hearing loss, uh, up to 72 decibel of intensity. Uh, the next confirmatory test is uh, impedance audiometry. Any patient with bilateral conductive hearing loss, there is a possibility of other causes also like fluid in the ear. Serous otitis media, and uh, at least so otitis media, ossicular discontinuity, eustachian tube dysfunction can also be seen because uh, we can't see uh, middle ear. Uh, we can only see the tympanic membrane, which is normal. We have to find what is the cause for uh, conductive hearing loss before proceeding into the other investigation and surgery. Hence, impedance audiometry can confirm the presence of otosclerosis. Here, what curve we'll get is called as AS type of curve. In about forty uh, percentage of otos cases, we will get AS curve. AS curve means compliance is usually uh, this is this uh, y-axis shows compliance, and this is eustachian tube pressure or middle ear pressure. Usually, normal pressure is between zero to minus two hundred. So, this pressure is usually achieved in normal person. We have a uh, moderate amount of compliance with. Normal eustachian tube pressure. Here, eustachian tube pressure is middle ear pressure or eustachian tube pressure is normal, but compliance is reduced. So, compliance reduced compliance with normal middle ear pressure is called A S type of curve. So, this confirms the presence of otosclerosis. In case of ossicular discontinuity, also middle ear pressure will be normal, but compliance will be raised. The curve will be here in case of ossicular discontinuity. Next, will be in the tympanometry. Uh, contains uh, impedance as well as stepedial reflex. Next, we'll be doing stepedial reflex. Stepedial reflex is used to uh, test the stepedial muscle. So normally, when we are giving a loud sound, both the stepedial muscle contract and pulls the stepes inward, which we can get through the graph. Here, there is normal curve, so ipsilateral and contralateral reflexes present. But in case of otosclerosis, even if stepedial muscle contract, the stepes is fixed or immobile, it won't move. So, ipsilateral and contralateral reflex will be absent, so it can confirm the presence of uh, otosclerosis. Uh, next is the more specific investigation of imaging. We will do a high resolution CT scan with one mm cuts and twenty degree coronal oblique cuts are taken. So, this is a coronal section showing the um, otosclerosis in the oval window. So, this is the temporal bone. Coronal section. This is the master. This is the middle ear cavity, and this is the oval window, which shows the thickening due to mineralization or dense deposition of the bone. And this is cochlear otosponges. So cochlear otosponges means otosclerosis present in the over the bony labyrinth of cochlea, that is around promontory and round window. This is the cochlea. This is vestibule. So we can see the dense bone, the which is also called as double ring. Sign or halo effect. There is a dense bone around the promontory or cochlea. Next, differential diagnosis. As I mentioned previously, any patient with bilateral conductive hearing loss, we have to rule out the other causes also before going into proceeding into step by step surgery. So the other differential diagnosis can be serous otitis media. Serous otitis media means serial effusion present in the middle ear, which we can confirm by impedance 
it shows a type b tympanogram and uh, next possibility can be atresa vortis media in which the tympanic membrane is very adherent over the promontory which uh, causes some hearing loss so we can test clinically by uh, checking for the tympanic membrane mobility by sigillation and then third can be tympanosclerosis tympanosclerosis means hyalinization or thickening of the drum because of a deposit which can be seen as a white patch over the tympanic membrane and uh, fourth possibility is ocular discontinuity as i mentioned previously it can be confirmed by impedance it will be showing a ad type of a curve that is the complaints will be high with normal middle ear pressure and next process can be malleus head fixation or congenital ocular chain fixation these two can be confirmed only during surgery that is exploratory tympanotomy we will raise the tympanometal flap and we will check for the ossicles each individual ossicle load of mobility we will be checking and next uh, going on to the management uh, what is the the main management is the surgical management that is we have to uh, remove the fixed stapes and we have to replace with the processes for the normal conduction of the sound from the middle ear to the inner ear but in some cases of active otosclerosis surgery is not done surgery is uh, even since during surgery there is no uh beneficial uh, no benefit benefit for hearing so we will be going on to the medical management in case of active stages that is the flaming or pink appearance if the patient is having cochlear type of hearing loss like sensory neural hearing loss if the patient is having tinnitus and vertigo we should go for medical management so medical management will give sodium fluoride along with vitamin d and calcium carbonate the mechanism of action is it decreases the bone reabsorption it increases the new bone formation and also prevents the enzymatic damage to the cochlea the dosage of sodium fluoride is uh, 22 up to 120 mg per day can be given for a uh, thrice daily for a period of about 3 to 6 months now there is a controversy medical management is usually not preferred nowadays and then next is surgical management the main uh, main stage of management is stapy surgery that is stapedectomy or stapedotomy in stapedectomy partial removal of stapes is uh, done and uh, in case of stapedotomy uh, the foot plate is opened followed by a processes insertion and uh, fenestration surgery will completely remove the entire stapes and we will be replacing with the uh, processes and uh, what are the steps uh, prior to uh, surgery we will usually do the surgery under local anesthesia why we are doing because if the patient uh, after uh, while well, doing the surgery if the patient after uh, uh, removing the fixed stapes and replacing it with the processes or a piston the patient will immediately gain the uh, the airborne gap will be immediately gained so the patient will be having a better hearing we can check per operatively during surgery itself and also during stapes surgery there is a risk of perilymph uh, leakage or perilymph crusher so the patient might be having sudden giddiness with nystagmus when we are doing surgery under anesthesia we can't see the nystagmus and giddiness so we are preferring to do under local anesthesia and if both the ears patient is having conductive hearing loss both ears so usually what which ear we have which is having more conductive loss or poor functioning ear is preferred because there is a risk of getting sensory neural hearing loss in surgery during or after surgery there is a risk for getting 1% uh, chance of getting sensory neural so which ear is more poor uh, functioning ear is preferred and we are also not doing surgery for both ears simultaneously we should give a gap of minimum 6 months to 1 year to operate one ear which is a poor ear and then we have to go in for a better ear next time and usually the surgery is done under endoscopic or microscope with the endoral incision and what are the inclusion criteria for surgery will uh, select the patients what are the appropriate candidates for surgery or the patient should be having a conductive hearing loss of about 30 to 60 decibel with a minimum airborne gap of uh, 15 decibel so pre operatively you have to do audiometry we have to confirm the diagnosis and the gain and the airborne gap should be of 15 decibel and the speech discrimination show should be more than 60% if it is less than 60% then there is a less chance that the patient get uh, can get benefit from the surgery and there should be no sensory neural component it should be a purely conductive hearing loss and we shall the uh, different type of processes for uh, used for uh, replacement of the stapes 
first is the the common materials used are platinum titanium teflon and stainless steel uh, the this is the she platinum teflon cup piston process this is the cup like this uh, cup is crimped over the long process of inkers and the end is uh, made into the canister of the foot plate of the stasis and this is the uh, piston processes and this is the mech g fish type of processes and this is housewife processes these processes are commonly used here directly from the long process we are keeping out over the foot plate here entire ossicles is replaced by a total processes from the tympanic membrane till the foot plate and the, what are the contraindications for surgery which patients we, sh we should not do surgery or if the patient is having that is the only here with hearing like if the patient is having one ear with 50 decibel of uh, conductive loss and opposite ear is a profound deaf ear then we should avoid surgery then because there is a um, as i said uh, earlier there is a chance of getting one percent of sensory neural hearing loss so we should avoid that so we have to, uh, we should not do surgery for a, if a patient is having only one functioning ear. And then um, in case of menus disease also, the patient might be having associated uh, uh, denitus vertecon sensory loss, uh, cochlear pathologies will be present. Even if we do surgery, the patient won't get any benefit. So we should not do so for patient with menus disease. And other canal infections, middle ear infections like autitis externa, CSOM, ASOM, that should be treated first before doing the surgery. It's uh, not absolute contraindication. It's a relative contraindication. We have to treat it and then we have to proceed for surgery. And extremes of age group, especially in a old age and in children, we should avoid doing stapes surgery. And uh, pregnancy also, it is not um, that done. Usually in pregnancy, the autosclerosis will be active stage. And after pregnancy, we have to follow up the patient and we can do surgery later. And in certain professionals like athletes, and uh, professions which require balance and equilibrium like uh, divers, scuba divers, flight, frequent flight travelers, and, pay, and uh, professionals who are working in a very noisy or constructing environment. In these categories of people, we should avoid doing the surgery. Because uh, after stepidectomy, some patients will be having a problem in balance. They can develop nystagmus or uh, perilymph fistula can also develop. So in order to avoid those complications in these profession, uh, we have to avoid. And in the patients with uh, hearing loss, it can prone, they are more prone to get sensory nerve hearing loss. So in certain professions, we have to avoid doing stapy surgery. And what are the nursing management, like uh, the, uh, immediate post-operative care, we have to do uh, immediately after doing the surgery in the ward is the patient might experience some nystagmus, giddiness, vomiting, and all. We have to control it by uh, medical management. We have to can give uh, team. Uh, some patients will also develop nystagmus due to disturbance in the periphlegm fluid. So we have to avoid the patient to immediately mobilize after surgery. We have to, we should not ask the patient to get from the bed without any assistance. So, and uh, also the actions such as uh, which requires the balance, equilibrium, like coughing, straining, lifting, heavy lifting, and uh, everything should be minimized, can lead to perilymph uh, leak also. And we should not try to get out of the bed without any assistance. And any infections or fever or drainage from the air has to be reported. And also we should avoid any respiratory infections and ask the patient to avoid flight travel or frequent uh, high altitude uh, climbing and all. We should avoid immediately after surgery. Next, what are the surgical steps of stepidectomy? So this is the normal uh, ear, which right ear, which we see when the patient is sitting or standing upright. This is anterior, superior, antero inferior quadrant, uh, posterior, superior, posterior, inferior quadrant. This is handle of malice. When we are placing the patient supine for ready for surgery, the position should be the patient should be in the supine with the air to be operated upright. And uh, we'll make a incision in the endoral incision in the external outer canal, pony canal. Uh, incision is made from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock and the flap is raised. And the entire tympanometer flap is raised when we can enter into the middle ear or tympani cavity. We can see the incus, incudostepidal joint, Stapes, crura, foot plate, stapedius muscle attaching into the pyramid, cauda tympani nerve, promontory, and round window. Everything can be seen clearly. And we have to remove the posterior superior, posterior inferior bony canal wall 
to uh, for the better visualization or access to the tympanic cavity then we are curating the bony canal wall and we have to avoid injury to the cauda tympani which can cause uh, taste disturbances later we have to uh, separate the cauda tympani from the menibrium and we have to see the structures next we have to check for the absence of round window reflex when we have to confirm the stapes fixation we have to tap over the ossicle and to check for the brisk round window reflex if it is absent it confirms the stapes fixation next we have to measure the size of processes so we'll use the instrument to measure from the distance from the long process of the incus to the foot plate and then we have to cut or reshape the processes according to the length and then we have to uh, fracture the incudostabular joint with a cure with a instrument and we have to make a perforation or a drill a hole over the foot plate of stapes this is called as fenestration we can use a instrument called perforator or a burr or we can even use a laser for doing a fenestration next we are going to remove the stapes and we are cutting the posterior cura stapedius muscle and uh, how to measure the length of the piston the length is as i told earlier medial surface of the incus to the stapes foot plate with additional 0.25 mm should be uh, should be added the range can be 3.75 to 4.25 mm then we have cut the anterior crura and uh, in all, before uh, cutting the posterior crura we have to place the piston uh, and then we will keep the long end over the foot plate and the round end will be crimped over the long process of the incus now we have cut that stabilis tendon and we have fractured the anterior crus also and everything is removed and the piston or process is stabilized with a gel foam or a graft material like vein graft or a temporally spatia or any other material and then we'll keep a uh, reposition the tympanum meter flap into position and we'll key, uh, fill, uh, fill the uh, entire canal and middle ear with the gel foam and this is a uh, surgeon operating the a patient with a microscope using a speculum and he is using a laser this is called as laser stepidotomy so the same thing we are using instruments for cutting the stepidotomous muscle we'll use the laser to cut the stepidotomous muscle and we'll make a fenestration using a laser the uh, the fenestration is characterized by the formation of a rosette formation after that we'll confirm we have made a fenestration so post operative imaging showing the a uh, piston stepidotomy piston in position this is the coronal view and this is the ossicle incus and this is the uh, piston which we have replaced for stapes stepidectomy here the, along with the supra structure there we removed only anterior posterior crura alone with stepidotomous muscle here we will remove the foot plate also along with the supra structure of stapes first we have to make the fenestration and then we will cut the foot plate sorry uh, we will cut the stepidotomous tendon and then so entire supra structure of the stapes is removed here along with the stepidotomous tendon and then we are fracturing now we are removing the foot plate from the underlying oval window we are removing it into two parts care to be taken before uh, removing the foot plate we should not avoid uh, harsh or um, increased force otherwise the foot plate can go into the endo uh, into the perilip so after removing the entire foot plate we'll keep a prosthesis there we used a piston here we are using the prosthesis and uh, uh, before keeping it we will keep a graft over the oval window which can be a vein graft or temporal spatia and we will seal it with the fibrin glue or gel foam and the end is crimped over the incus and uh, what are the complications of stapes surgery intraoperatively as i mentioned earlier while fracturing the foot plate the foot plate can become uh, uh, into go into the perilip and leads to submerged or floating foot plate which is very difficult to remove and uh, we can also cause damage while lifting the tympanum meatal flap and it can lead to tympanic membrane perforation or uh, damage to the ossicle especially incus incus can be dislocated and uh, damage to the two important nerves which is facial nerve leading to facial palsy and the cauda tympani nerve damage to cauda tympani nerve can cause 
uh, injury, uh, taste disturbance or uh, loss of taste of the anterior two third of tongue. There is something called a stepidial persistent stepidial artery which can lead to hemorrhage. We have to abandon the procedure if there is continuous bleeding. And uh, other serious and rare complication is perilymph flooding. We have to make a control fenestration. If the fenestration is more aggressive or more beyond 0.5 mm, it can directly enter into the inner ear perilymph scala vestibuli and entire perilymph will be gushing out. The patient will be experience a violent nystagmus with the severe onset giddiness also. So we have to close the leak with a thick graft. We have to place the sandwich uh, uh, thick graft over the entire thing and we have to so play, um, uh, pack the entire middle cavity with the gel foam and we have to abandon the procedure also. Then the post-operative complications can be, there can be tympanic membrane perforation I mentioned earlier, infections to the middle layer of canals leading to otitis media and external. Since it's a foreign material, it can lead to granuloma formation around the oval window. If there is some puncture hole in uh, foot plate, our oval window, it can lead uh, later into perilymph fistula. The patient can experience something called a stoolius phenomenon that is giddiness on uh, straining or uh, or uh, coughing or uh, valsalva maneuver. And uh, it can also, there is a chance of one person getting sensory neural hearing loss post-surgery. And if there is persistent airborne gap, it, 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 uh, it implies that the surgery has been failed. Failure of surgery is, can be because of inexperience of the surgeon or uh, ill-fitting or uh, the, the pro, uh, not uh, loose processes and the process has been displaced from the incus or uh, it has not been put properly into the fenestral position or it can be a loose ill-fitting or short or whatever it is can be a good low quality processes also or uh, development of a uh, once again water spaces over the piston can also develop and these are the common causes for the persistent airborne gap or conductive deafness even after the surgery. And next is vestibular dysfunction. Can, there can be also some giddiness or nystagmus following surgery also. This leads to vestibular dysfunction. And uh, delayed facial uh, palsy can also occur following surgery. The patient will be having facial par paralysis, especially after uh, laser surgery. So if a patient is not willing of surgery or not a candidate in case of active pregnancy, old age, or medically not fit for surgery for those patients in order to, for uh, achieving uh, hearing, uh, good hearing, we can go for, those candidates can go for hearing aids. Thank you.